Amen. Well, one of the things that I love about being a pastor here at this church is that it's expanded me so much further than my ministry degree prepared me for. Um, by that, I mean I have, uh, not only am I a pastor, but I'm also an amateur furniture mover, um, uh, an amateur plumber when the occasion arises. Uh, I've done on occasion some electrical work around here as well, none of which am I qualified to do, uh, but we do it with excellence. And actually, um, by doing things around here, it, it helps us to save money on some of the smaller things um, so that we can afford the professionals for the bigger things. And in addition, though, it, it has grown me as a person. And so I'm able to do a lot more projects around my house. Um, and so it's, it's really benefited for me quite a bit in my personal life. Um, I can always tell when it's gotten to be about 110 degrees because Pastor Jay says, hey, next week, let's get up into the ceiling of the church. Um, and so usually by that point, it's at least 115 degrees outside. Um, and then we decide to go and do whatever project that is. So I wanted to tell you about a spiritual experience I had in the ceiling of our multi-purpose building. It happened a couple of years ago, and we needed to run some cable from the, the sound booth all the way to the front of the building so that we could get those TVs that feed at the front of the building. And it was, in fact, about 115 degrees out. Um, the access point for that is not anywhere near where we needed it to end. It actually is on the opposite end of the building in the very corner in a closet. And so what we do is we get up there into the access panel or in, into the access hatch and we put a floodlight so we can kind of orient ourselves to where it is. There's actually now reflectors up there that I've put up there so I can find my way to exact spots. And so what we were doing is I had to walk it all the way along the length of the building and then make an L shape to where we needed the, the feed for the TVs. And when you get up there, there's not any ventilation. There's no, uh, there's no access to the outside, so there's, there's no light coming in. So whatever you have for light is the light you brought with you. And so while we were up there, was, or while I was up there, it was hot, and I thought, I, I wonder how dark it really is. So I turned off my light, and because of where I was, there was all kinds of vents and insulation blocking the floodlight, so I couldn't see the floodlight. When I turned that light off, I could not see my face this close to my hand. I had never been in a place so dark before. I've been in dark places where I, you, know, you can barely see your hand, you can make out the shadow, I couldn't see it at all. And I was doing this just to see, and I couldn't see anything. And then while I was there, I took just a moment, and I, I realized the position I was in, where I was at. It was very dark, and it was very silent. Because of the, the insulation, it absorbs all the sound up there, and because I was alone, there was no sound, and it was really hot, really hot. And as I, thought, as I sat there in the darkness, I just, I felt the overwhelming power of darkness. It was oppressive. I could feel, it just, it was not fun to be in that much darkness. So I turned the light on, and I started my way back, and once I got to the end and I saw the, the light, I was like, okay, now I just have halfway to go still. Um, and then I got, as I was going, I had a spiritual moment. The Lord just said, isn't this like you and me? And I stopped, and I go, wait, what, Lord? Now it's hot, so I wanted to get the picture really quick. But... While I was sitting there, I go, what do you mean, Lord? And he goes, when you were in that darkness, you went there. You left me. And as I, as I came back to the light, and as I was getting closer back to the floodlight, I was just filled with this understanding that 
the darkness that I was experiencing was because of my relationship to the light. I put myself in that darkness. God didn't go anywhere. That light didn't move. It was entirely up to me in my proximity where I wanted to be. And that's so much like us that we, we, we find ourselves in a dark place and we go, why? And we realize that it's because we have walked away from the light source. So the question I want to open up with and I want to ask you today is that I've been wrestling with for the last few weeks, so now you get to wrestle with it, is are you the architect of your own darkness? But before we get into that, I want to introduce myself. My name is Pastor Angus. I'm the family pastor here at Cornerstone Christian Center. If today is your first day with us, welcome. We are so glad to have you as a guest. Um, I am super excited to be able to speak with you today. Uh, just a little bit about us here at Cornerstone. We want to, uh, we see ourselves on a journey with Jesus. None of us have arrived, none of us are perfect, we all fall short, and so that's why we use this image of the disciples walking with Jesus, because just like them, none of us have arrived. They're all still following Jesus, they're all still in process. And so because of that, it takes the pressure off of us to be perfect people because none of us are perfect. We're just trying to be more like Jesus. And that's, that's our goal here, is to be more like Jesus. We do that a few ways. We do that by loving God, making disciples, and reaching the world. And if, if you're interested in finding out how we go through that process, uh, a big way that we do that is through our life groups. So we just started a semester. We're a few weeks in. If you have not joined a, a life group for the semester, I encourage you, get connected, find one, find your family, find your church friends, um, because those uh, life groups are absolutely incredible. Well, today we're gonna, uh, I'm going to continue us in our series on dwell. Uh, Pastor Celeste did a great job starting us off last week. A uh, very encouraging message on faith, hope, love, peace. Uh, she spoke from the book of Esther, and uh, it was just a great message. One of the things that stood out that I just, <clears throat> excuse me, that I absolutely loved was she said that, you know, if, if these are the end days, God must have sent, uh, saved the best for last. And that was just very encouraging to me that God would save the best for last. And so if we are the last generation and he saved the best for last, that, that means that in all of those situations, God needed you for that situation. And that was just super encouraging to me. So the first scripture that we're going to touch is Joshua 1.6, this idea of dwelling in the presence of the Lord. We want to spend time with God. It says in Joshua 1, 6, Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause the people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Father, I thank you so much that you have a message for each and every one of us today. Lord, I just pray that you would be over this, that you would use my words, and that you would speak your message to the hearts and minds of everybody here. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts, our ears, and our situations to what it is that you would speak. And Lord, I just pray that none of us would be able to leave unchanged today. In the mighty name that is Jesus Christ, amen. So with Pastor Celeste opening us up on faith, hope, love, peace, all of that stuff, I thought, what better thing to talk about than darkness? So as you know, I'm your favorite pastor who loves to bring you the, the heavy topics, you know, and, and so we're going to talk on darkness today. But before we get into that, I want to make sure that we're all operating under the same definition of what darkness is. So you've got this one that we can all agree on that is pretty, uh, pretty self-evident. Uh, one, the absence of light, blackness, obscurity, or gloom. And then this is the third definition, but we're going to use it as the second definition today. It's a state of ignorance or error, especially on moral or religious subjects. Hence, wickedness or impurity. Now, based on those two definitions, how many of you, if you don't have it now, have experienced darkness? 
I would say that we all have, and we all currently are living in one of the darkest times that, that I've ever experienced as a Christian, as I've ever experienced as a person, period. There's a lot of darkness. Evil is no longer hiding itself. It's just out there for everybody to see, and now we have to make a decision, evil or good. The line is no longer blurred. It's, there, there's a whole lot less grayscale in today's world. It's becoming very black and white. And so if you're not a part of the light, you're fading into darkness. And so with that, I've, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this topic, and I have found that there are basically two ways you can find yourself in darkness. Now, there may be some outliers that I'm happy to, to debate with you uh, later on, but when it comes to darkness, sometimes you're the reason, sometimes you're not. So it all falls somewhere in there. Sometimes it's your fault that you're in a spiritually dark place, a physically dark place, an emotionally, a relational dark place. Other times, it is your fault. Sometimes it's not, sometimes it is. So today, with that idea that sometimes it is your fault, sometimes it's not, we're going to look at two characters from the Bible today. The first one is Joseph. I love the story of Joseph. For those of you who don't know, Joseph came from a big family. Uh, he had several older brothers. Now, being the favorite child, I can recognize a favorite child. And Joseph was his parents' favorite child. Now, I am the favorite. Uh, you can ask my mom. She's right over there. Feel free to ask her. And then, uh, if you want to, you can call my siblings and verify. Um, but see, Joseph, he was not liked by his siblings because he was kind of a stool pigeon. He would go and, and tell on him. Now, these boys were shepherds, and so they would do things that boys would do in a field with sticks and rocks, right? We don't know the details. However, we know that Joseph would come home and tell on the boys. And because of that, he wasn't the favorite amongst the siblings. And I don't know about you, but you have to be careful when you're in the desert with a place full of holes uh, who you mess with. Or you might find yourself in a hole in the desert, which is exactly where Joseph found himself. His brothers threw him in a hole in the desert, um, and, uh, and then some slave traders came by and they sold him into slavery. And uh, now Joseph had plenty of, of reason to be upset. He had plenty of reason to be upset, but he ended up getting sold to a, a powerful Egyptian named Potiphar, and the Lord blessed him in his time there. So it says in Genesis 39.1, and again, if you haven't read this story, I encourage you, go to Genesis and read the full story. But it said, now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian... And it continues on, but it, it begins to say about how the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and was in the house of his Egyptian master. Now, Joseph had every right and every reason to be upset and he could have played the Cinderella card and just, you know, be cursing his brothers while he's scrubbing, uh, scrubbing Potiphar's floors. But instead of that, he had a good attitude. And he worked for Potiphar as if he was working for the Lord. And so even though he was in a bad situation, it didn't change the way he operated. And so he still served Potiphar as he would serve the Lord. And because of that, the Lord was able to bless him. So I want to encourage you that if you're in a dark place, maybe at work or whatever it is, there is reward in your attitude and having a good attitude. See, because what happened here is that as Joseph rises through the ranks of Potiphar's house, he gains attention of Potiphar's wife, who comes after him, and when he denies her advances, um, Potiphar has a choice. He can either side with his wife or throw, you know, or, or side with Joseph, and uh, he sides with his wife. So she, Joseph ends up in prison. Now, this guy, who all he was trying to do was make his brothers better people by telling them all the things, by telling on them, you know, all the things that they were doing out in the field. Now he finds himself a slave and in prison. Plenty of room for a bad attitude. 
But see, again, he continued to work and serve the Lord, um, and he continued to have that good attitude. And as a result, and through a series of different um, events, he ends up before Pharaoh, where he has an opportunity to interpret a dream for Pharaoh. And when he does well at that, Pharaoh places him as number two in the land. There's nobody underneath him, or there's nobody above him except Pharaoh. And this is in a time where Pharaoh is one of the most powerful people on the planet. So that's something to go from being a slave to being number two in command over one of the, the most powerful countries in the world. And a big part of it had to do with his attitude even amidst his darkness. You see, in Romans 8, 28, it says it like this. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. What's so exciting about that is that you are God's people. And if you are called to something, which we know you are, that all of the things that you're going through right now are all for a reason. It may not be for you. It may be for somebody else that God is allowing you to go through this so that he can see you through it so that you can tell other people about it so that you can be a hope for them. But if your testimony sucks because of your attitude, it's really hard to share the good news. See, so that was Joseph. And, we're ta and we talked about him. And like I said, he had every reason to. The next guy we're going to talk about, uh, not as much, Jonah. See, this guy, it was all his fault. In fact, the people around him knew it was all his fault. You see, in, what we have to understand is that as people, we are not islands. We don't live this life alone. And so we can be the cause of somebody else's spiritual darkness. So husbands, we can be a source of spiritual darkness for our wives. Wives, you can be for husbands, parents to kids and kids to parents. We can all be the cause of darkness in somebody's life. And, and Jonah was the cause of darkness in some, some guys' lives too. See, if you don't know the story of Jonah, he was a prophet in the Old Testament. And God wanted to send him to Nineveh, to a city that he was about to bring judgment on and destroy. And so he said, I need you to go and just warn them that if they don't turn from their ways, this is what's in store for them. And Jonah said, yeah, but I don't really care for those people, so no thanks. And he went the opposite direction. He went to Tarshish. And God has a way of getting a hold of you if he really wants to. He, um, so as Jonah is running from the Lord and running from his assignment, um, this storm comes on, on the ship that they're on, and they're all trying to find out why this storm is going to take them down, and they all come to the conclusion and understanding that it's Jonah's fault, that God is mad at him, and that's what this storm is about, and so they want to throw him off, but at the same time, they recognize him that this is God's guy, so they, they go uh, in Jonah 1.14, they say, Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, and they hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. See, God, Jonah had gotten him to a place where he was at odds with God. And God really needed Jonah to go and complete this assignment because there was a city at stake. But Jonah didn't see it that way. He just saw it as a group of people that he didn't really care for. And so he was the architect of his darkness. So he gets thrown off, of the, uh, he gets thrown off the boat. He gets swallowed by a giant fish. Uh, God lets him sit in time out for about three days before it vomits him out back onto the land. Uh, and then after a quick shower, Jonah decides that he's going to head off to Nineveh. When he gets to Nineveh, he preaches a five-word sermon that basically says, hey, repent, and everybody repented. 
As a pastor, that's a good day. If you can say five words and everybody comes to Jesus, that's a good day of ministry. I pray for those kinds of days of ministry. So Jonah has this ministry, everybody repents, but he still is hoping that God still might smite at least a few of them. So he walks out of the city and he, he wants a front row seat. So he sits down and watches. He grabs his popcorn and he's just waiting for the show to begin. And it doesn't happen. And then as Jonah's getting there, it's hot, it's the desert. Um, God causes this, this tree to grow up above him and provide shade. And so now he's like, thanks, Lord, I got shade for my show. And then nothing happens except a word comes and eats away the tree and it dies. And then he's really upset about the tree dying and not really moved at the fact that an entire city of people were going to die. And so the story kind of leaves Jonah there. But see, Jonah was in a place of darkness too. It was entirely of his own making. So when you look at those two stories, and when you look at where we are, we see, once again, that sometimes we're at fault, and sometimes we're not. So again, are you the architect of your own darkness? If you are, that's okay. There's no condemnation, because we all build that in our lives at some point. And that's why it's so important that we need to dwell with the Lord. We need to come and we need to say, take some time. We need to figure out what it is that's causing that darkness in our life. And we need to come and sit with the Lord so he can deal with it. Psalm 23, 6 says it like this. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, what if you find yourself in darkness? See, it doesn't really matter how it happened. It doesn't matter why it happened. And sometimes it doesn't even matter when it happened. There are things that happened to us that, that God never intended. And so if that's you today, something happened to you that brought you into a place of spiritual darkness that was not your fault. And that person may or may not know the Lord. They may or may not be here. But I want to apologize on their behalf. Say, I'm sorry. Those things were not meant to hurt you. They were not meant to, to be on you. But we know, because he's a good God, that in those circumstances, in those instances, he can take what happened and turn it into good. He can heal you from whatever that was, and then use you as a source of healing for other people. So sometimes we need to forgive, and it's that unforgiveness that causes uh, darkness. But see, we're supposed to let our light shine. And if we're in the dark and we don't know how we got there, it's very hard for us to let our light shine. So it doesn't matter necessarily why or how. What matters is that. That you don't stay there. That you don't allow it to define who you are. See, because darkness has a way of twisting things. It has a way of twisting the truth, and it has a way of twisting what you see as reality. I was just, before this service, I was actually thinking about the, the creatures that live in the really deep depths of the sea where it's really dark. Those things, man, they look scary. But they need to out of necessity. So if we live our lives in darkness, we will start to look like something that's supposed to live in the darkness. And that's not very appealing. So it doesn't matter how you got there or why you got there. It matters that you're there and that you don't stay there. So how do you do that? It, it could be that maybe you're not even experiencing a whole lot of darkness. Maybe you just feel like you've grown cold in your relationship with God. Maybe you're just feeling like you're not as close as you, you once were because we should be able to walk this journey and go, hey, Lord, should I go this way? 
But more often than not, it's like, hey, God, am I supposed to do that? Uh, I'll figure it out. And then we continue on our own way. I'm, I'm guilty of that in a big way. But see, I've, I've spoken with a lot of different people, and over these last couple of weeks, um, I've, I've talked with a lot of Christians, a lot of people who go here who said, you know, I'm just, I'm feeling a little colder in my walk. I, I'm not feeling as far along as I was. I'm having a hard time reading my Bible or, or whatever it is. So I want you to be encouraged that you're not the only one. We all go through it at times. What's important is that we don't stay there. And that we recognize that we're there. So if so, so if we're in darkness, then why? Then we figure out, okay, what is it that's causing this darkness? I'm here. I don't like it. What's causing it? If it's because of politics, vote. If it's because of unforgiveness, forgive. If it's because you're not reading the Bible, crack the book and read the Bible. There's a lot of very simple solutions. And what's so great about the Lord is that just like in, in the story that I was telling you, he doesn't go anywhere. He just, he's there waiting for you to come back. So when you walk away and you come back, you're like, wait, I left God right here. Where'd he go? He doesn't wander off like I do doing other things. He's, he's there waiting for you to come back. And when you do, he goes, hey, I've been waiting for you. So I want to issue a challenge to you. Because again, most of us, we end up in, uh, in seasons for, for varying reasons. Now, I, I've identified a pattern in my life. You see, I'm, I'm a, I've got a Martha spirit, which is a servant's heart, somebody who loves to serve people. So there was this story about uh, these, these people were having a dinner party for Jesus, and, and Martha, one of the sisters, she was the hostess with the mostest. She was making sure everything was ready, and the food was up to temp, and everything was great. Um, but while she was doing that, her sister Mary said, I got to go to the bathroom. And then after she went to the bathroom, she went and sat at Jesus' feet and didn't want to do any of the work. And so Martha started to get really frustrated with Mary because she wasn't helping out. And Mary was kind of frustrated with Martha because she just wanted to sit at Jesus' feet. And so the challenge to you is, why are you growing cold? Is it because of the way you're choosing to follow Jesus? See, for me, what I found out, because I have this Martha uh, spirit and I love to serve people, I get so busy serving God that I forget to sit with God. And so I'll, we, we have natural seasons, Christmas time, camp time, that are very busy here. And usually what ends up happening is when I get to the end of one of those seasons and I'm just exhausted, I'm burnt out mentally, physically, emotionally, I get angry easier, and whatever it is, I go, man, Lord, why am I so tired? And he goes, because you've been doing it all by yourself. That's right. You see, and so I get so busy serving the Lord and, and doing things for other people that I forget that I need to stop and have time for me to have time with the Lord. It's supposed to be a relationship where we're continually walking with him. That's why we don't show, about, we don't show the picture with the other crowd that was following Jesus. We show the one who's walking right by him. So I want to challenge you because if you're a Martha... If you're one of those people who serve, and what we know about church is that a very small percentage of people do the actual, do the ministry of the church. We've got a small group of people who do kids' church and, and uh, our cafe and, and various areas. So there's, there's a few Marthas, but there's far more Marys usually in a church. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, except eventually the Marthas get burnt out. And if they get burnt out, then stuff stops happening. So I want to challenge to all the, the Marthas in the room that take some time and be sure that you're not so busy serving God that you forget to sit with God. But then on the other side, all of the Marys 
who you just enjoy sitting and, in, and taking in everything the church has, that's great. But it's also time to pour some things out. Be like the Red Sea, not the Dead Sea. See, the Dead Sea has all the stuff coming in, but nothing going out. And as a result, nothing grows in it. But then you've got the Red Sea that all of this good stuff comes in and it pours out. And it's a huge station for life and trade. The problem with today's church is we've got a lot of Dead Sea. We've got a lot of Christians who come every week and we want you to come. But when you come and you get filled up, then you need to be poured out somewhere. Find some place to be poured out. And we have a really easy way for you. Segue into next steps. So you can, you can scan this QR code and what it does, it's really cool. This is an amazing process to help you go from a Mary to a Martha. You scan this code, and what it does is it takes, you through, it takes you through our membership process, okay? What it does is there's, there's personality tests. There's three personality tests on your favorite subject, you. So you go on here. You take the personality test. You fill out your information, the things that you're interested in, and then what it does is it tells you, hey, you're, you're really suited based on your giftings. You're really suited for this one or this one or this one. And if you're not suited for kids' ministry, that's okay, because my wife is not suited for little kids. She's not. Five-year-olds get me. That's why I work with the little kids, and she works with the high school kids. But see, then we can plug you into the area where you fit, whether it's in front of people or not, whether it's helping out or, or whatever it is. But there's a place for you. And as all the Marthas see that other people are starting to volunteer, they go, oh, this is nice. We have some help, guys. And then you've got it, so you've got longevity in your volunteers because not every, the people who are volunteering aren't so tired. This isn't in my notes, and I, I did... Uh, mentioned it during first service. There was a time that um, early on in my ministry that I, I found myself in this place where I was really cold and I, I was having a really hard time hearing from the Lord. And I was up at the leadership retreat uh, for the youth pastors uh, up at our campground and I, was, I could take you to the spot. I was standing there worshiping and I just said, Lord, why aren't you speaking anything fresh to me? I want something new. What, I, I need something to go and pour out. And he goes, what was the last thing I told you? So I had to stop and I had to think about it. And I thought and I thought, and eventually I came to what it was that the Lord, the last big revelation that really did something in my life, man. I was like, oh yeah, that. He goes, yeah, that wasn't for you. That was for them. What did you do with it? I was like, oh, I, I held on to it because it was so good. <laughs> so I realized right there that that revelation that God had given me was not meant for me. It was meant to give to somebody else. And until I went and gave that message, he was quiet. So that I would, because he knows how distractible I am. So he knew that he couldn't give me another message or I'd never get back to that first one. So right there, I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize, I didn't realize that that was for them. I, I promise this Sunday, I will take it back and I will, I will give that to the youth. And as soon as I did, man, he just started to pour more and more and more into me. It was amazing. And that's when I really got it straight that the stuff that you guys get here, the stuff that we get here, while yes, it does benefit us, it's not meant for us. It's meant for everybody else who wasn't here to hear. So when, when God gives us a word and we give it to you, you're supposed to go out and give it to them. And that's how we chase the darkness away, is allowing God to be the light inside of us, and then we can be the light out in the rest of the world. So are, the, are you the architect of your own darkness? See, one of the things I love about camping 
is the fire. The fire is great because there's so many analogies that you can use with it. We're, we're very much like the stuff inside a fire. We want to be right there towards the center, burning bright and hot. Because when you're in the wilderness, there's light, there's warmth, there's safety in that fire. And as you kind of tend it, you know, you, you stir the stuff around and, and the, the wood that's kind of gone out to the side, you, you flick it back in and it goes from white to red, it goes from cold to hot. And sometimes things will pop out, out of your fire ring and you can watch how in the darkness, how fast it gets cold. That's why church is so important. It's not all about the building, but it is about being with other people of like precious faith, allowing them to feed your fire when you're feeling not as hot. And so if you find yourself, without judgment, it's, if you find yourself off and away, it's very simple. You just flick it back into the fire. It's as simple as praying and saying, Lord, I've, I've grown cold. I'm sorry. I didn't realize I'd walked away from you because the reality is, is when we find ourselves in darkness, it's not because it, it happened all of a sudden. It's usually a very slow walk away from the light. And then when we find ourselves, it's very cold. So, what we do is we just allow our lives to be stirred up. If you found yourself to be cold, you just move a little closer in. But the other thing about a fire is you can't just put a few logs on and then it's done. You have to continually feed it. You have to put more fuel on. And the more fuel, the brighter it burns, the bigger it gets. And that's what this is about. Because up there, Right now, we're, we're waiting for people to fill up the balcony. And once we do, we can't do it with the people that we currently have. And if our fire is not big enough to heat the room, people will go find a new fire. So we have to be ready. We have to be burning white hot. We've got to be ready for the Lord to do something in our lives because as we get close to the fire, as we, get, as we dwell in that place where we're close to the Lord, he chases that darkness away. You don't feel so cold. It doesn't feel helpless. It's an incredible place to dwell with the Lord. But see, you may be here today and you may go, well, I've never come into relationship. I don't know what it looks like to dwell with the Lord. Well, that's easy. In just a few minutes, we're going, to, uh, we're going to pray a prayer that would bring you into relationship with Jesus and that you would know that you're no longer on the outside, that you are who we are talking about, and that the darkness that's in your life does not have to stay there. In fact, it has to flee at the name of Jesus. So I'm going to ask the worship team if you would begin to make your way up here. My question to you is, have you embraced Jesus? And I'm going to ask if everybody would stand with me. Have you embraced Jesus? Have you come into relationship? Are you still out in the cold where it's dark? It says in Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 that because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. That's the answer to darkness right there. Is that the Lord is willing to come in, Jesus paid the price so that we didn't have to live in darkness. So that we can have hope that no matter our situation, there's an answer to it. And not only does he wanna make you better, he wants to make the people around you better. 
And so with heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you, you recognize that you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. I'm gonna ask that you would just raise your hand briefly and once I see your hand, you can put it back down. We just wanna know how to pray with and for you. And in a second, we're all gonna pray a prayer together. So if that's you, just raise your hand, put it back down. Thank you, Jesus, I see that hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now, this prayer that we're gonna pray, there's nothing magic about it. It's all about the position of the heart. And that when you pray these words, that you genuinely mean it. And if you do, you come into relationship with Jesus. And then you begin the process of God chasing the darkness out of your life. So if you would, repeat after me and pray this prayer. Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me of my sins. I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, if that's you, friends, congratulations. Today is your spiritual birthday. And I want to encourage you that we have a prayer banner back there. If you want, we also have some resources to help you along your journey uh, as you begin this, this incredible walk called Christianity. But for the rest of us and for everyone here, this is your opportunity to, to stop and do a self-check and see, are you cold in your walk with Christ? Are you in a place of real darkness? As we open this altar, I wanna encourage you that just because you come up, just know that you're in the company of other people who have darkness and nobody knows what it is but you. But if you stay in the dark, you'll be in the dark. If you don't like it, come forward and allow the Lord to minister to you, to do something. Don't walk out of here unchanged. Lord, I pray for your people. I pray that as we all open this altar, that you would help us to have a real minute with you, Lord, where we examine where we are in our walk with you, where we see what it is that's caused our darkness, Lord, and we come against that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would minister to us where we are, so that you can take us where you want us to go. We pray all this in the mighty name that is Jesus Christ. Amen. What a great word for Pastor Angus. Amen. So appreciative for that. Well, we are excited. Um, next week is our fall family day. And so please bring someone with you, a neighbor, a friend, a colleague, coworker, anyone. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun activities, but I want to encourage you, we need volunteers. So if you can sign up, there's a physical paper out in the lobby that you can hand sign your name to. You can also go on the app and sign up through there. And then bring something to share, a, a side dish, a dessert, things like that. We're going to have an amazing time. And so it's going to be after second service, but if you come to first service and then you don't come back, we still need you during second service to do many things. And also if you can bring candy that's individually wrapped, we're going to use that for some fun stuff stuff next Sunday. But you don't want to miss it. It's going to be a great day. Amen. Before we go, we pray this blessing over us. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lord, I pray a blessing upon your church, your people. Lord, you would anoint us with your spirit to live your love out to those around us. We pray all this in the powerful name that is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Know this. We love you very much here at Cornerstone. God bless you. And have a great week.